Okay, hello, sexy, beautiful people. We are back for another episode. Now, I keep getting comments asking if I can tell you what yarn I'm using and what I'm making. The thing is, I'm usually working on a project for an upcoming video, so I don't really want to spoil it. But this is the Friends Cotton 8-4 from Hobby. I'll link it down below. I also need to address the fact that this week's episode was supposed to be on procrastination, how I deal with it. And I recognize the irony of me now having procrastinated the procrastination episode two times, but I'm trying to alternate the more serious, substantial episodes with the more lighthearted ones. And the Situationships episode really took it out of me mentally and emotionally. So I wanted a little break before I dive into another loaded topic. So yeah, procrastination will be next time. But today we are going to talk about how I got back into reading as an adult. I've had a very funny relationship with reading over the years. If you start with childhood, I mean, I'm going to sound like an angry boomer, but you know, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have phones. My family in particular didn't even have cable television. So books were by far the most entertaining thing in my life. And I read the normal stuff for my age, like Junie B. Jones. But when I ran out of my own books, I would read my sister's books and she's four years older than me. So I was reading the assigned literature for sixth graders when I was in like second grade. I remember when I took the reading assessments, I would score ridiculously high although that advantage quickly wore off in the following years. And I shared a room with my sister growing up and I remember there would be times when my parents would be out late and we were supposed to be asleep when they got home, but we would always stay up reading our books. And when we heard the garage door opening, we had like 30 seconds to turn off the lights, throw our books like under the blankets and pretend to be asleep. And I look back on it and I'm like, <laughs> What kind of nerdy ass children were we that the thing we were most afraid of getting caught doing was reading? <laughs> but yeah, I loved reading, although it was probably the first manifestation of my very addictive personality. I remember in middle school, I started flipping through my friend's copy of the first Percy Jackson book at school and I could not put it down. So I was like, I'm gonna take this home with me and I need you to bring the second book tomorrow. And every single day I would go home, literally not move until I finished the book, do my homework like super late at night after my parents went to sleep and then come back the next day and switch it out for the next book. And I just repeated this until I finished the entire series, at which point I had like not slept for a week. And by the time I got to high school, I, okay, I should give you the context that I had like a tiger mom light upbringing. I definitely didn't have a tiger mom. My mother is literally the most loving, sweet, affectionate person ever. And also the other moms in the town I grew up in were way crazier, but, my upbringing was very centered around college admissions and trying to get into an Ivy League school. So I was not leisure reading in high school. I was busy taking my APs and engaging in like 47 million extracurriculars. Okay, wait, this is actually so embarrassing. I did read two books outside of the school curriculum and it's only because I was preparing for college interviews and realized they ask you what you like to read. And I was like, um, the last book I read was the Percy Jackson series in middle school. So I ended up reading Freakonomics and then one of the Malcolm Gladwell books. I don't even remember which one. I had not read that kind of format of taking science and economics, but applying it with real life examples. So, I mean, I liked them and I did talk about them in my interviews. <laughs> okay, and then we enter college where I did not read books outside of school, but I also did not read the books that were assigned for school. I think this is a common phenomenon for overachieving kids who are just kind of programmed to be good students, but I am so good at strategic skimming. Like I can flip through a book for maybe 30 minutes and write an essay on it or take a test on it. And I don't know if that's really a good thing because I did not actually read any of the assigned curriculum in college. I mean, I will say they would give us excerpts and we talk about it in class. So I feel like I got the main takeaways, but I do wish I'd read the books for my behavioral psychology course. It was titles like Thinking Fast and Slow, just describing how you can design decision processes to cater to human psychology and how we think through things. So yeah, I graduated from my little Ivy League institution having read no books during my time there. And after I graduated, I went on a grad trip, very classic. And we went to Southeast Asia, which is even more classic. And one of my friends on the trip has always kind of been into YA, like young adult fiction. And she was in the middle of reading the Summer I Turned Pretty series. Keep in mind, this is like years before the TV show came out. And she was like, oh, I'm reading this series about this Asian girl who gets hot. And then the two brothers that she grew up with are now both in love with her. And I was like, that sounds so fucking whack sign me up immediately. So I was literally reading this random PDF on my phone. And the only reason I didn't fully become absorbed by this book is because I was in Thailand, which is literally one of my favorite countries in the world. If you put me anywhere else, I would have just been tied to my phone 
addicted to this series intended for people like 10 years younger than me. Oh my god, what's even funnier, I ended up going to the the Summer I Turned Pretty Series 2 premiere here in New York last year. I'm pretty sure all the influencers there had not actually read the books. Meanwhile, I was going up to the entire cast being like, guys, I read this entire series on PDF, on my phone, on my grad trip in Southeast Asia. And they were definitely like, this girl is giving off a weird energy right now. So yeah, I finished the Summer I Turned Pretty series, realized that the author, Jenny Han, was the same one who'd written To All the Boys I Loved Before, which I think had already come out on Netflix. So I read that series too. And then for some reason, I read the Crazy Rich Asian series, which I found kind of disappointing. But yeah, these were all read on PDF on my phone, which is definitely not good for like my body, eyes, posture, anything. Yeah, and then I started work and then I was definitely not reading. Oh, actually, I just remembered. I did read one book during banker training. Basically for investment banking, they fly all the new hires out to New York and they, I don't know, do like on the job training, but also you have to do prep for your series exams because you need to pass them to get the licenses to work as a finance professional or something. Anyway, basically for like six weeks, you're just spending every day in this giant room with like hundreds of other new grads and you're just listening to this one person drone on a stage. Point is, it was so boring and I also am really, really bad at staying awake. I'm very good at being high functioning when I'm sleep deprived, but I need to be actively engaged in something. If I'm not, I will fall asleep. I'm like um a computer, you know, if you don't move the mouse, it goes into hibernate. That's me. So sitting in this training, it was like impossible for me to stay awake. And I was just looking for stuff I could do on my laptop that would prevent me from passing the fuck out. And I ended up reading, this is so random, but Memoirs of a Geisha. And it's because growing up, we would watch movies that weren't always appropriate for kids, but we would just have pillow scenes which was basically like anytime something adult started happening, my sister and I would just put the couch pillows in front of our faces. And then once the scene was over, we'd remove them. And that's how we got through our rated movies as a family. But Memoirs of a Geisha, there were a lot of pillow scenes. And I also think I was just too young to really understand what was going on. So that whole plot line was always very shrouded in mystery for me. So I felt like it was a good time to read the book and just understand what exactly went down in that movie. But yeah, I think that book effectively kept me awake for at least a few days of training. And once I started working full time, I obviously was not reading. I was literally in the office like 24 seven. Once lockdown hit and things lightened up for a little bit, well, that's when I discovered TikTok. So I was spending any free time I did have like sewing, crocheting, making my little videos. That's one thing I will say, as much as I love reading, my crafting has always taken precedence. Like any free time I had in high school, I spent crocheting really ugly things, but yeah, making clothing. So basically a few years later, I ended up quitting my private equity job because I was in the deepest depths of my depression. I don't know why this era seems to come up in like every other podcast episode, but I moved home back to SoCal for a little mental health recovery period. And the degree to which I escaped reality by immersing myself in content was truly incredible. Okay, obviously it's not healthy in the long term, but I actually think when you're first really going through it, it's not a bad thing to find a little bit of escapism through media. So the first two weeks after I moved back home, I did not speak to a single person besides my parents. And I literally sat in bed or sat in a park and crocheted while watching TV or read books. And that was it. And honestly, this was a very healing time for me. I ended up rewatching all of the Gourmet Makes series from Claire Saffitz on Bon Appetit. I discovered Drive to Survive in F1, so I watched all the available seasons of that. I watched Bridgerton season two. I think this was right around the time that came out. Proceeded to rewatch Bridgerton season one, then rewatch Bridgerton season two. And then I was like, okay, there's nothing for me to rewatch because I've just watched everything in the span of like 36 hours. So I turned to the books. I don't know if you're familiar with the Bridgerton book series, but it's literally period smut. Like they do one book for every single sibling. There's like eight of them or something. And every single book is just an enemies to lovers arc that ends in like these passionate graphic scenes. And I ate that shit up. Like I loved the romance and I loved the predictability and it was exactly what I needed. But yeah, that period smut was the last thing that I had read as an adult prior to this year. It's a running joke with my friends that I have never been seen reading. Like no one can confirm that I am actually literate. And I had two excuses for why this was the case. The first was that I get way too addicted 
And I mean, this is true, like for TV shows, I literally have to read the synopsis or I cannot go to sleep because I cannot stop watching. And the second reason was that I can't crochet while I'm doing it. The only reason I watch so much TV is because it's like my background noise while I'm crocheting. And honestly, I don't really set aside time for myself to just be fully immersed in any kind of entertainment. I always need to multitask, which... Well, that's a whole other thing to unpack. But the impetus that really got me to change this was deciding to pursue content full time. I don't want to feed into this narrative that influencers are dumb and we don't have to use our brains. Like, I definitely still use a lot of strategic thinking and putting these podcast episodes together, for example, definitely uses way more brain power than an average day in my corporate job did. But obviously there is a more academic side to the brain that is not really getting used when you're not in a more typical desk job. And I figured a good way to balance this out or even just make me feel better about it was getting back into reading. So I ended up passing by the Brooklyn Public Library and getting a library card. And then I could use the app Libby, which allows you to borrow like normal physical books, but you can also get audiobooks. And hence began my audiobook journey. And y'all, I really went off. I have read, I think like 15, 16 books since I started. And that was like eight weeks ago. So I've basically been reading two to three books a week, which is an insane improvement from like one book every three years. And I wanted to talk a little bit about audiobooks versus reading physical books because it is still a very different experience. I mean, the obvious pro is that you can read a lot more, right? Like you can put it on instead of music while you're commuting, doing laundry, running errands, whatever. And that's what's allowed me to read so much the past few months. I also think that for certain kinds of books, the audiobook format really brings it to life. So for example, if it's a memoir and it's voiced by the author, then it just turns into a person telling their own story. Or if it's a book that has people speaking in a different language or people speaking with an accent, and the person who's voicing the book can do those accents correctly, that also adds another dimension. It really turns it into like voice acting versus reading. Now for the cons, it's obviously very easy to zone out when you're just listening to it in the background. And sometimes when I'm reading a physical book, I'll read a paragraph and be like, wait, I didn't actually retain any of that. So then I'll just go back and read it again. But with audiobooks, Sometimes I'll zone back in and be like, oh, well, I still know what's going on. So I just don't bother to rewind the 15 seconds to reread what I missed. I also think that listening to books while you do other tasks definitely removes some of the intentionality of reading. Like I am very aware of the fact that I have basically just replaced music and podcasts with audiobooks. And it's just a way for me to like fill the silence of my everyday life and blanket everything with content and make it feel like I am kind of getting double the productivity out of the same amount of time. Okay, and the last thing, the same way that voice acting can really add a dimension to a story, it can also kind of detract from it. Like I haven't read Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes yet, but my friend listened to the audiobook and she was like, the guy who voices it doesn't sing the song lyrics. Like he just speaks them and it's kind of off-putting. Or I really don't like when a book is narrated by like a female narrator, but they use a guy voice when they say the bits of dialogue, like they try to like take on different voices. I'm like, at that rate, just find another voice actor or use your normal voice. Like this is weird to me. <laughs> all in all though, I am very glad that I found audiobooks, partially because it justifies my years long excuse that the only reason I don't read is because I can't crochet at the same time. But also I think I had lost my love for literature, not with the content of the story or the storytelling, but literally the way things are written. That is such a specific art form that I just, have not taken the time to appreciate literally since, I guess, high school. Now I have been sharing reviews on my Instagram story, just really quick thoughts on each book as I finish it, but a bunch of you have been asking for a full video. So I figured now would be the perfect time to just walk through all the titles I've read this year and give you my honest opinions on them. If you read a lot, I would love to know if you had the same or different thoughts on any of these books. And if you haven't been reading, I think there are a lot of good recommendations in here to kind of get you back into it. Okay, we're gonna take a pause from the crocheting because I need to pull up this list. Now, the first book I listened to was I'm Glad My Mom Died by Jeanette McCurdy. I've been wanting to read this since it came out. She basically talks about her abusive upbringing from her mother and trying to work through her mother's abuse after her passing. And I'm actually really glad I listened to this versus physically reading it because, I mean, you're hearing it in her voice, like it's someone that we know, a public figure. And I also think it's so bone chilling hearing her recount these really traumatic stories in just such a deadpan, matter of fact tone. I also think it's just such a bold statement in the title to say, you know, I loved my mother. I recognize that a lot of what she did may have come from a place of love, but I 
do not owe her any absolution or forgiveness for what she did and my life is better without her. I would definitely recommend this if you're trying to get back into reading. I mean, it obviously is very dark, but it's less like reading and more like just hearing Jeanette tell her story. The next book I listened to was Crying in H Mart by Michelle Zahner. She's also the singer of Japanese Breakfast and it's another memoir where she talks about her relationship with her Korean immigrant mother. As an Asian American girly, I had been hearing about this book and what surprised me was I didn't actually find it that sad. Maybe I'm just heartless. What really stuck with me was the writing style. It's so poetic and there's so much figurative language and I've just never seen Asian like grocery stores, Asian food written about with such beautiful imagery. The part I actually related to the most was her relationship with her mother's side of the family in Korea. That feeling of having so much love and being so close and knowing your family, but also really lacking communication or language or physical time spent together. It's very, very similar to how I feel about my family in China. So after the depressing mother-related memoirs, I decided to read something a little bit more lighthearted. I listened to Everything I Know About Love by Dolly Alderton. I didn't know anything about this book going into it, but it's a British woman talking about her 20s, crazy dating stories, friend drama, etc. I mean, I thought it was entertaining. I was like, damn, she did some crazy shit. But overall, I found it kind of forgettable. I didn't realize it's like being hyped up, especially on TikTok as this life-changing book with all this wisdom for young women. I mean, I definitely found a lot of parts of it relatable, but in general, I just thought it was like silly and entertaining and cute. If you want an easy, funny read though, I would definitely recommend. Now, the next book I read was Stay True by Hua Xu. We are back to the depressing memoirs. It's this Asian American author talking about his time as a student in UC Berkeley, his relationship with his best friend, Keith, and Keith ends up getting killed. That's not a spoiler, by the way, it's on the back of the book. I fear this one may have been slightly overhyped to me ahead of time. I don't know, it's beautifully written and I really enjoyed reading about the specifically male aspects of being an Asian American and being an immigrant child because I'm obviously less privy to that. I also loved seeing the Bay Area depicted in literature. I only lived there for six or seven months, but I was really close to the Berkeley campus. Most of my friends there went to Berkeley, so it just made it feel a lot more real and intimate. Overall, what I found most notable was the very indie film-esque pacing of the book. Like, it obviously does not follow an Aristotelian plot structure. They literally spoiled the most climactic event. And so it's just a very kind of slow, steady, paced read. But I think that is part of the beauty of it. Okay, next book is Three Women by Lisa Tadeo. This one's interesting because the author actually interviewed these three real life women and then sort of told their story from their point of view. And it's three different narratives about women and their sexual experiences. And this really made me realize how little media I've consumed that even attempts to give an honest depiction of the sexual experiences of women. And even though none of the three stories are at all similar to me, like one of them is her having a relationship with her high school teacher, I weirdly found more of it relatable than I expected. And it just truly feels like a book written from the female gaze. Well, obviously they're literally real stories from women. If you're a woman, definitely read it. If you're not a woman, also definitely read it. Okay, next book is Educated by Tara Westover. We are once again, back to the depressing memoirs. I have been hearing about this one for years since it came out. And it's basically a memoir from this woman who grew up in a super extreme and isolated Mormon family in Idaho, I think, and how she broke out, ended up going to college, going to Oxford, becoming a writer. What I will say about this book, the part that stuck with me the most was the actual content of like what happened, like just the insane traumatizing shit that she experienced. And in some ways that kind of stuck with me more than the storyline of her breaking free from her family. She definitely talks about all the guilt and the repeating cycle of trying to, you know, build boundaries with her parents and how difficult that was. But maybe just because I was reading so many trauma memoirs, that journey did not stick with me as much as I thought it would. So at this point, I was really done with the trauma dumping and I asked on my story for lighthearted book recs. And then I posted the list of recommendations and everyone was replying and saying like half these books are not lighthearted and everyone is lying to you. But the one, or not the one book, the first book I read off this list was The Bodyguard by Catherine Center. Whoever recommended this understood the brief. This is literally like a Disney Channel original movie in book form. It feels AI generated how many tropes they managed to fit into like one rom-com storyline. But honestly, this was a break I needed. It was entertaining. 
no complaints. Now this was around the time that my reading pace was clearly outpacing the speed at which I could get books on Libby. You only get five holds and nothing was becoming available. So I just scrolled through their recommended books that were available now and ended up reading The Paris Apartment by Lucy Foley. Now this is a murder mystery where it jumps between different POVs, like different characters in the story. And they also have different voice actors for each character, which really brought it to life. I was addicted to this book. I forgot how much I loved Agatha Christie growing up, but there's so much action. I feel like you really get to know each character. And I loved that given I'd been reading all these memoirs that were written from like only one point of view. And when you think you know who committed the crime, there's a twist. And I fucking love a twist, okay? And I was not getting any twists in my memoirs because like I knew people were gonna die. So after that, I ended up reading another murder mystery recommended from Libby called Rock, Paper, Scissors by Alice Feeney. This one jumps between different times versus different character POVs. It's also much more like eerie and spooky versus action-packed, but I love the voice and the character development of this. There's also a twist. If you're struggling to get into the sad memoirs or you just want something a little bit more escapist, I would definitely recommend The Murder Mysteries. It feels the most similar to like watching a TV show. Okay, next book is Writers and Lovers by Lily King. This is just a nice, sweet story about a woman figuring out her career, becoming a writer, figuring out love. Like, it's a very good balance of still very poignant and real, but also funny and relatable really easy, enjoyable, sweet breed. Love. Oh, and we're back to the trauma memoirs. Next book is What My Bones Know by Stephanie Fu. She talks about her really traumatic childhood and getting a complex PTSD diagnosis, working through that, just her general healing journey. And I loved this book and I did not expect it to be that relatable because I was like, I really have not gone through anything that traumatizing. But what I've realized is like, no matter what you're healing from, there are some universal threads in the healing journey. Like, there's one part where she's talking about being in Brooklyn actually, and trying like every single mental health, wellness, healing treatment there is out there. And I remember when I was really going through with my depression, I like hit a point of desperation where I was doing yoga, running, journaling, meditating, like every possible tropey thing for your mental health you can think of. This is also the only book where I stopped to write down a quote. That's another con of audiobooks, by the way. It's a lot harder to just like scroll down bits you like. The context is that she's talking about a turning point in her healing journey. She says, I'd expected that curing my trauma would be like climbing a six floor walk up while holding a suitcase, hard one and painful. This revelation proved that second chances did not always have to be fought for. They could be taken in handfuls for free like after dinner mints. Could I truly clear the fetid swamp of a past like mine with dandelions and butterfly stretches? Was it really that simple? No, not exactly, but it was a start. And this really stuck with me because obviously there were moments in my healing journey when I was like, I'm never getting better, I'm fucked. But there were also moments of hope when I was like, oh, like maybe this won't be as hard as I thought. Just because I've been in the deepest, deepest, darkest depths doesn't mean I have to have the most painful, grueling climb to get out of this hole. Oh my God, and this is another book where I would recommend listening to it instead of reading it because there are parts where she includes excerpts from her therapy sessions. And I assume in the written format, it's like a transcript, but in the audiobook, she includes the actual clips and it's so jarring and moving to hear her voice, like how she speaks in therapy versus how she speaks when she's narrating the rest of the book. That was so impactful. I don't know, in general, I liked the fact that this book was a little bit less poetic and a little more colloquial and practical. Like she really just talks about everything she tried. She's also a journalist, so she interviews a bunch of like academics and professors trying to understand her trauma in a cultural context. I don't know, there's just a lot to relate to in this book. Okay, next book is another Asian author. There's a lot of Asian authors and it's Severance by Ling Ma. Funnily enough, I couldn't get into this one. I tried and then I didn't even finish the first chapter before I abandoned it because I saw an Asian author and I guess I expected like another memoir, but the opening scene is apocalyptic and I normally don't like apocalyptic shit. I ended up coming back to it because so many people recommended it and it basically jumps between an apocalyptic present and then the past. And the fact that this book was written before COVID happened is so scary. Like if I were the author, I would be freaked out. I'd be like, did I manifest COVID? Like the scenes where the narrator is still going to work, still going to the office when the world is literally deserted around her and crumbling around her is so poignant. And it reminds me so much of like early stage pandemic when the world was 
literally ending or like Black Lives Matter when so much was going on in the world and I was sitting at my stupid laptop like making bar charts and moving around logos and I was like what the fuck am I doing right now? Such an incredible book. I'm so glad I read it now though because my friend read it in April 2020 and I'm like if I read it then it would have destabilized me. Okay the next book is by far and away, my favorite book I've read so far this year, it's Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zevin. My best friend, who very rarely raves about things, was raving about this book, so I already knew that I was gonna love it. I don't want to say too much because I don't want to spoil it, but it's just a story of two friends and their friendship over the years and them working together to develop games. And I think they're making a movie. I am so invested in knowing what the castings are. Like, if this movie is bad, I'm gonna be so sad. It's just, it's so sweet and funny and sad and beautiful. The characters are so well developed. Like when they fight, you don't side with either one. They both have their faults, but you also understand both of them. And I just feel like it's a book that everyone can enjoy regardless of what genre you normally lean towards. Next book is finally not an Asian author. It's a black author and it's Mom by Jessica George. I'm definitely saying that wrong. It's a word in Nigerian. It tells the story of this woman in London who's a child of Nigerian immigrants. And this was so interesting because it's a story about intergenerational trauma, being an immigrant child, like being that daughter who has to bear a disproportionate amount of burden in the family. So many things that... I know about so intimately, but in an Asian American context. And I loved seeing how similar it was in this Nigerian British context, but with just like different cultural nuances. It ends with a lot of hope, like the main character and her family are beginning to talk about their trauma and heal and work through things. And that was very moving to see because frankly, that happens so rarely in reality in immigrant families. So even to see it play out fictionally, was very healing for me. Okay, and the last three books I read were the Hunger Games series. I know it's crazy. I didn't read them as a kid. My best friend is obsessed. She watches all the movies at least once a year and she was flabbergasted, but also so jealous that I get to experience them for the first time. It is kind of beautiful to experience a childhood thing for the first time as an adult. They were way darker than I expected. I guess I was expecting more like Harry Potter, Percy Jackson vibes. I forgot that this is dystopian versus fantasy. What I also found interesting is that it's a lot more show versus tell compared to other books for the same age range. Like I finished the first book and I was like, I don't know that I understand who Katniss is. They don't really spell it out for you and she's so busy literally fighting for her life. I really feel like it took the whole series for me to understand who she is as a woman. I still haven't watched the movies. I was freaked out at first because Mockingjay is like so graphic, but I watched some clips on YouTube and the movies are definitely not as dark, so I think I'll be okay. I'm really excited to read Ballad of Songbird and Snakes though because I thought President Snow was by far the most interesting character. Overall though, way more beautiful and complex than I expected. But yeah, those are all the books I've read so far. Keep in mind, I am not that good at like reviewing books because I haven't been reading them for the last decade. I'm still building my repertoire. This is also just my take on what I found memorable. It's not like an actual review of how well it's written. Please leave in the comments down below if you've read any of these books. I would love to know your thoughts. I hope I can get some of you into reading through this episode. And as always, thank you so much for tuning in. I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys!